Now I come to the speed Q&A in which I will um, try to answer actual direct questions um, in a quicker fashion. So the first two questions are these. First is, could you elaborate more on critical theory of international political economy during the lecture regarding post-colonialism and current economic action using COVID-19 as an example? Second question, why Europeans didn't wear masks when the coronavirus first spread? Um, and those are different questions from different um, students and um, maybe it's relevant here that the second question does come from someone who's um, not European and wonders about the weird action of Europeans. Both questions are not obviously related, but I think one can make a relation between the two. So what could you say is the post-colonial dynamic of the current pandemic? Um, post-colonialism typically refers to the fact that the world we are living in is shaped by its colonial past and this colonial past is somehow continued into the future. So we're not living in colonialism anymore, but neither are we living in a society which is not colonialism. We're living in a society after colonialism in which colonialism still affects our daily lives and um, uh, international relations and IPE as well. So when we look from this lens at the crisis, we look at um, how are certain relations um, still affected by um, colonial past and also how are certain mindsets um, affected by this past. And here we can, for example, give an account of the crisis where Asian countries were first affected by this crisis and they took it very seriously from the outset and they took very strong countermeasures to begin with. And this is true for for mainland China, for Taiwan, for Singapore, for South Korea, for Vietnam and for all nations, um, not, not so much for Japan, but for most um, nations in Asia affected by the um, pandemic early on. And you can find many reasons why this might be the case that they took it so seriously. One of them is probably that all of these, or most of these countries had um, bad experiences with past coronavirus outbreaks, which was particularly the SARS outbreaks um, in 2002, 2003, and later the MERS outbreak. So they, they had some bad experiences, they had institutions that learned how to handle these kind of outbreaks, and so they had some basis to build on. The Europeans and North Americans, however, they were only affected two, three months after um, many Asian nations. And so one could think, well, they had plenty of time to see what was working in Asia and what was not working in Asia. So they should have been really well prepared. And as you see in North America and most European countries, they weren't this well prepared as you would think they could have been. And now you can think why this might be the case. You could say, well, the Asians had the advantage of having been affected by other coronaviruses and the Europeans and the Americans didn't have this privilege. And I'm sure that this has something to do with it and you find other reasons. But I am quite convinced that there is um, another explanation as well and this relates to a certain post-colonial mindset which, which um, I would say is that many people and governments in Europe and in the United States think they are kind of invincible and something that might be dangerous to Asian countries won't affect them this badly. And you can hear many um, many examples of this kind of thinking when you listen to the discourses early, early on in January, February and March where you hear a lot of politicians saying, well, this is just kind of a flu, we have very good healthcare systems, we have very good hospitals, very good um, medical professionals, we will just be able to handle this. This is not going to be a big problem um, for us. And if you say this, you're implicitly also saying, well, those Asians, they are kind of hysterical and they just exaggerate the problem. And also the WTO, they're exaggerating the problem. So it's not that serious. And boy, is it serious. And how does this relate to Europeans not wearing masks when it first hit? I think part of the answer is and I don't mean this in an offensive way to Asians, I mean it in an offensive way to Europeans, is that Europeans think or thought 
that wearing masks is just some crazy thing Asians do. And this is part of European thinking and this might have something to do with a certain post-colonial mindset where I think we as Europeans and Americans, we are reasonable people. Asians, they are kind of nervous. I don't know. And so there is maybe this kind of, of post-colonial, somewhat racist thinking that backfired bigly. Yeah, let's say bigly uh, on, on the United States and um, European countries. And the story unfortunately does not end here because um, we also have other countries that are not in Eastern Asia and not Europe or North America, um, particularly in Latin America, in Africa, in the Middle East, in South Asia, um, and so on. And all of these countries would have probably been affected anyway, even if the Europeans and the North Americans handled this crisis very, very well the virus would have spread there. One can be quite sure of that. However, this massive spread in North America and Europe accelerated this a lot because there's much more travel between North America and, and Latin America or between Europe and um, Africa and South Asia and so on. So this certainly played a role in making things much worse for um, these countries which are mostly former colonies, while European countries are um, former colonists. And then it gets even worse because now, as I mentioned um, last week, we also have the problem that um, uh, protective gear and so on are scarce resources right now. So there's a scramble to get the masks, to get the protective suits and so on. And who can buy them on this, on this tight market? Of course, the Europeans and the North Americans can buy them much better than African or Latin American countries. So it's not only that the slow response in, in, uh, in the richer countries made things directly worse for the poorer countries, it also then made it harder for them to respond to this crisis. However, you can also imagine that there might be other kind of dynamics. It might be um, that because the pandemic spread this harshly to North America and Europe that um, the availability of medication and vaccines might even be uh, better for poorer countries also. Because something that's also very post-colonial that we see in um, medical research is that diseases that affect Europe and North America, they are very well researched and many companies and, and, uh, and other actors are very invested in finding cures for diseases that Europeans and North Americans suffer. If, however, only people in poorer countries suffer from these diseases, not as much money and not as much energy will be invested in finding cures or vaccines. And you can easily see this with um, malaria, which is probably the most deadly disease um, at all still, but there's not that much research done about um, malaria um, um, drugs or, or treatment or vaccines or anything. Um, and there's more research on, on some minor um, inconveniences in, in European countries than on deadly diseases um, in other countries that don't affect Europeans. So it might be that because this pandemic affects Europeans and North Americans, that much more energy and money will be invested into curing and um, stopping this pandemic than it would have been if these countries are not affected. And I'm not saying that therefore it's a good thing that Europeans are affected or anything because that would be silly, but we can see that in a post-colonial world um, cause and effects might just be paradoxical to some extent also. That was not a very short answer. I have to get better at the speed Q&A. Um, next question. Um, question is, the new classical definition of economy describes it as the allocation of spare resources. How does this definition work regarding digital resources like Netflix movies or video games? Is it useful to use this def definition describing the distribution of resources which are not spare or in any way limited? For example, the high demand for watching Tiger King does not affect or limit the offer, so are there better ways to define economy in the digital 21st century? This is a very good question and I just would kind of frame it a little differently. If we define econo economics or the economy as a, the allocation of scarce resources, first of all, this also means 
that any resource that is not scarce or cannot be allocated can never be part of economics. For example, if we think of clean air, this is something that's out there and we all need it to live. Yet, it's not a scarce resource because there's so much of it out there, so there is no economy of clean air or hardly any. Um, if we think of sunlight, on the other hand, this is also something we all kind of need um, to live, at least some amount of it, and it can also be a scarce resource. If you are um, in, in Alaska and it's a winter, then it's, sunlight is very scarce and you might want more of it. However, it's not something that anyone could really allocate, so you cannot say, well, we have so much sunlight in Antarctica in December, let's send some to, let's ship some to Alaska. It doesn't work this way. So, in order for anything to be part of the economy, it A, has to be sparse, and B, it has to, there has to be a possibility to allocate it somewhere. And if you think of this, about this from a business person's perspective, then you would say, well, we have to make things scarce in order to um, have some economic benefits from it. And yet yeah, you can make silly examples about this, and one of my favorite silly examples um, is from another TV show from the pre-digital age, if you want, um, from The Simpsons. I heard it's um, streaming at some new streaming service these days, um, but I don't know if you know it. There's this one character, character, caricature of a greedy rich man called Monty Burns, and he often comes up with schemes um, to make more money. And one of his meanest schemes is an attempt to monetize sunlight or um, to at least make it artificially scarce to earn more money because he's the owner of the local nuclear plant. So he says, well, what about all this free sunlight? This is ruining the, ruining the whole market. So what he says he will do is he'll create, uh, create a great umbrella shielding off the city of Springfield from sunlight and then he can make money. So what does he do economically? He makes an abundant resource, a scarce resource, in order to monetize it. And you find many different um, examples in the actual economy where these kind of mechanisms are actually happening. One of them is the fashion brand Supreme. There's nothing special about this stuff. There's, it's just stuff that you could buy anywhere else also with the red um, label Supreme on it. And this is not very special, there are a lot of red labels out there. So what makes these things so desired and so um, expensive is that they create them sparsely. So there might only be a couple of hundred, um, um, a couple of hundred uh, t-shirts of a certain kind of t-shirt and only because they are so scarce is it that people want to buy them, is it that people are willing to pay a lot money more than the thing costs in um, production. So creating artificial scarcity is an actual thing in economics. And it's only, of course only the case if you have an economic uh, an economy where um, people want to earn money by producing stuff because otherwise that would, this would just um, be a silly thing to do. And you also see the artificial creation of scarcity when it comes to um, um, digital media. And this is what the question was all about. It was about digital media. Here's something comes into play that we call scale effects. Oftentimes the amount in which you produce something affects the cost of producing it. For example, if you produce one car of a certain kind, it'll cost millions if not billions because you have to do all the research and development, then you have to get all the special parts and then you have to assemble them in a way, you have to test it all and this costs a lot, a lot, a lot of money. If however you create a million of these cars, each single car will get much cheaper because you only have to do the research and development once, you have to do the testing only once and you can buy the steel and all the stuff in large amounts so each car will get cheaper if you buy, if you build a million of them. And so you can also sell them for less money and this is part of the reason why uh, maybe, um, I don't know, a Volkswagen is cheaper than a Lamborghini. However, scale effects are limited when it comes to things as cars because still, if you, even if you build a million of a certain type of car, 
each car will still cost a lot of money to produce because you need a lot of raw materials, you need a lot of um, labor time, and so it will still cost a lot of money. It's different with digital media. There you have to basically invest the time mainly into the research and development, which might be the programming or the producing of a TV show. And after that, the scale effect is pretty, pretty much unlimited. So whether one person streams a Netflix series or a million people stream it, it doesn't change the cost that much. There's only like a little bit of server capacity, but each single person streaming that doesn't really affect the cost of um, the output. What will cost is the programming of a computer game or the production of the TV series and then maybe um, also the marketing. But the scale effect is unlimited there. So from the perspective of the business person, it's very important still to create sparsity there. Because in common sense you would say, well, if it doesn't cost anything more to give away a million of these computer games than a hundred of these computer games, then just give them away for free because it doesn't cost you anything. From a business person perspective, you can't argue this way because you only produce this game or this TV show to earn money and then you have to have some way to make people pay for it. And if you give it away for free, people will not pay for it. So what you have to do is create artificial scarcity which happens in computer games if there are some kind of copy productions, uh, copy protections, or if you force people to um, activate the game in some online mode, or if you only are able to play them while you are online, or these kind of mechanisms are there to create artificial scarcity. And something similar can be said about um, streaming um, of, of TV series and so on. So this is something that seems very paradoxical, but I would not say that this is a problem of defining economy because the way the economy works, it's still about scarcity and those things that are not scarce, there's no real economics of it. If some um, IT person creates some uh, open source software and then makes it free to download on the internet, you could say there's not much of an economy to it. You can define economy another way and then say there is one to it, but the scarcity is still very, very important in our world. What we could, however, argue is that this is not a very smart way to have the economy in a way where, in a world or a time where um, you can reproduce stuff at no cost, so we should have another kind of economy. But if you have another kind of economy, it cannot be built on um, uh, investors having to create stuff in order to gain more money, you have to find other ways the investment works. And you can say, well, we have the state, why don't we have the state do this? And then you have to decide if you want this, would you really prefer a world in which TV shows are produced by the state rather than um, by Netflix or some Hollywood studios? And then probably your decision depends on whether you are from um, the United Kingdom and know the BBC or whether you are from Germany and know German TV shows. And if you are if you are used to the BBC, you might say it works fine. If you're used to German TV shows, maybe not so much. But maybe states can be better there. The next question is one that surprised me that I didn't expect, uh, but I find it very interesting. Here it goes. There are some Muslims who believe that there is an Islamic theory of economics. Do you think that there is an Islamic theory of economics and can it be classified as a critical theory? The answer to the last question, of course, depends on what you define as a critical theory and what you define as an Islamic theory of economics. If you hear theory of economics, you can think of two kinds of theories. You can think, on one hand, descriptive theories, so how do economics work? And here I must say I never really heard of any specifically Islamic theory on how the economics in the world out there do work. Um, I'm not sure how it, how there could be such a theory. On the other hand, there are also um, like normative theories on how the economy should work and according to which rules it should work. And there I do know that there are certain Islamic doctrines um, that prescribe certain courses there. And most notably, the one thing uh, I know, and it might be a cliche, but that's what I know, um, is that there is also a prohibition 
on taking interest, which is also there in Christianity, but um, many uh, Muslims take uh, their creeds more seriously than many um, Christians do. So I know that there are Islamic investment um, uh, business or businesses that offer Islamic investment where they say, well, this kind of investment that we have here, it's halal and it's in a way that is um, allowed in our um, religion. And so this is a normative theory of religion where you say that certain things are allowed and certain um, things are not allowed. And of course, then it also probably in an Islamic economy, you wouldn't produce, uh, wouldn't live on producing alcohol and um, um, uh, pork or um, have a gambling industry, I, I guess. So could you say that there is such a thing as an Islamic or more generally a religious um, theory of economics that is also a critical theory? It strongly depends on what you define as a critical theory. Oftentimes critique is defined as something that stems from reason, where reasonable people look at the world and analyze it and then say, well, these things work and they kind of not work in a good way or there are problems here. So it comes from critical, rational analysis. And this can then be um, opposed to um, dogmatics where you just believe in stuff that you were told that are good. And you have, if you have this kind of understanding of, of critique, and if you have an understanding of religion, where religion is about a dogma that is handed down to you, then it's very hard to bring um, critical thinking or critical theory and a an, um, religious doctrine for the economy really together really well, because then they are kind of opposed to one another. However, there are also other ways to define critique, and there's one, one way that where it kind of could make sense. There is this tradition of thinking, um, which is um, personalized by, by Emmanuel Levinas or Judith Butler, who say that social critique is a certain social practice where you, where you decry injustices in the world and you make a claim for justice. And they argue that, particularly in, in, within Judaism, there is this prophetic tradition where there were always prophets coming through the world who are saying, well, here's this grave injustice and we want justice and then somehow relate this maybe to some kind of revelation from God or some other kind of way. But they would always say, well, this is social critique as good as it gets because this is a social practice where injustice is, um, is, uh, is um, judged negatively and where justice is claimed. And if you find um, Islamic um, teaching that you could group here, where you say, well, we have this Islamic approach to the economy that makes exactly this thing. It looks at the world, say, we have this great injustices here and we want justice. Then you can say, well, this is a form of social critique. And then you can say, well, this is also maybe relating to critical theory. This is also an argument that you often hear in relation to liberation theology in Latin America. And this is a way you could argue, although I personally, I am not convinced that there is such a thing as an Islamic theory of economics that is a critical theory, but maybe you can still convince me. Next question, concerning the reading, could you please explain again the difference between the terms international political economy and global political economy as the text mentioned that they are sometimes not used interchangeably. The, my main point here is that you can define these terms in different ways and different ways can make sense in defining these terms. And I find the way that O'Brien and Williams use the terms very reasonable. I can understand them and they make a lot of sense. The reason why I just didn't repeat the same thing in my lecture is I don't want you to believe that this is the way the terms are used in general. So as a reminder, here's what they said. They um, say that they have three different terms that are used for three different um, things. So first they use IPE or International Political Economy with capital letters to um, discuss the field 
of study, the academic dis discipline. Second, they use the term international political economy in lowercase letters when discussing the stuff that's happening out there, the economic and political uh, activity across state borders up until the last quarter of the 20th century. And finally, they use the term global political economy or GPE when um, referring to the environment from the last quarter of the 20th century until today. And this absolutely makes sense. I mean, I, I did the same thing with the capital letters and the lowercase letters myself. And in addition to this, it makes sense to say, well, we had some international economy all, all the time because there were always goods and other things crossing borders. So there was internationality, but we only have a truly global economy for the last couple of decades. So this absolutely makes sense. But you also have to see what's marked in red here is the words we will use. So it's a usage of the term that they say they do in the book. And you can also do the same thing and it's a smart thing to do. But please don't expect that everyone else out there in every other book will use the terms in the similar way. Because as I argued, some will also use the term GPE for the academic subject, for example. Next question. You said that critical theorists believe that there is exploitation which should be overcome by the people who are actually exploited. Therefore, I was wondering if critical theorists have elaborated this um, a little bit more as I don't really understand how they think people who are exploited can overcome it themselves. I think this is an obvious question because those who are exploited and who are oppressed are obviously in the weaker possession. So how can you push the burden to change things on the weakest? And this is the problem. However, who else would overcome exploitation and oppression if not those who are suffering from it? You cannot wait for those who benefit from op oppression and exploitation to overcome it. There are oftentimes some collaborators who benefit from oppression and still help overcoming it. For example, many white people in the United States were engaged in the anti-slavery movement. However, there probably wouldn't have been an anti-slavery movement if it weren't for um, blacks, so for slaves or former slaves or people who could be slaves um, to fight it. And there are many critical theorists who elaborated on this um, a lot. And I cannot recapitulate it all this here, but what it comes down to is that those who are oppressed have to become aware of their oppression. They have to become aware of the fact that this is nothing natural, but this is a social order that could be different. They have to educate themselves, they have to organize, and then they have to go into some kind of struggle with those who are oppressing them. And of course, also hope for some kind um, of collaboration. And there are some revolutionary theorists of this. There are some um, reformist theorists and some who say, well, they also have to be um, us because let's face it, we're all academic studying at the uh, University of Tübingen or even teaching here. So we are all highly privileged in some way or the other. So it might also be our task to help those who are more exploited um, than us to organize themselves and so on and so on. So it's complicated, but there is no alternative. Next question, why is gender always named as a relevant theory? International political economy is obviously unbelievably complex with many different actors all around the world. So it seems like an absurd idea to try to explain things based only on one single factor, gender. What am I missing? Or are gender theorists not only overwhelmingly about gender and name misled me? Short answer is a yes to the last part. Of course, IP is very complex. And of course, it would be silly to say, well, here's, here's my concept of gender, I put it on IPE and now all problems are solved or at least explained. Good thing is, no one really does this. What those who push for more um, um, attention for gender in IPE say is not, it's all gender and all we have to do is gender research. What they argue is, it all has to do with gender and there is no aspect in IP that is unrelated to gender. So we better think of gender when we think of IPE 
and think of this as well. But no one would say we don't have to think of anything else. And the reason why, or one of the reasons why it might seem otherwise to some people sometimes is that there is a strong tradition in basically all scholarly disciplines to not think about gender. And um, those people who were not thinking about gender were in a vast majority men who, men who were not thinking about gender. And so it was mostly feminists or other female scholars who had to push these men of taking gender seriously as a social category. And so some of them had to push for this really hard. And one of the effects of this pushing very hard is that in textbooks such as ours, there will typically be one chapter um, on gender there. And if you write a textbook and there's no chapter on gender there, someone will somehow, in the best case, the publisher will say, well, the chapter on gender is missing, please add a chapter on gender. Or if not, latest reviewers or so will say, well, there's no gender here, it's not a good book. Um, so takeaway is gender is important. Be aware that gender is important, but no one is saying that gender is all that is important. Next question is again referring to the diagrams. Question is, the tables in the beginning of your lecture showed that the world is in an economic crisis, which is worse than the one in 2008. Now many governments uh, want to help their economies through financial stimuli. My question is, if these stimuli work, how they work and how they affect the inflation. Of course, there are a lot of different kind of stimuli because the crisis is manifold that we have at the moment. Mostly, or oftentimes, crisis in capitalism are demand crisis, meaning that there are not enough people who have money to buy all the stuff that is produced. And it sounds silly, but that's the way capitalism oftentimes works. Because in capitalism, there's typically a lot produced, and at some point, there's so much produced that there are not enough people there who have the money to buy it, and who want to buy it. And this then leads to the fact that those who produce cannot sell their stuff, so they cannot make profits, and then maybe they have to lay off some of their employees, and then the employees will have even less money, and then will be able to buy even less stuff, and then there's a vicious cycle of crisis. And so what the government then does is to put money somewhere to break this vicious cycle. And this is typically um, either one, one way to overcome this is to give consumers money and then they will have more money to buy cars. One example is uh, what was called cash for clunker in the United States in 2009, I think, where the state, uh, where the, the federal government just gave consumers money if they trashed their old car and buy a new one, which is then good for the car industry. It is said to be good for the environment. I have my doubts. And it might also be good for those who are thereby able to afford um, new cars or who would have bought a new car anyway and now um, get some money for it. And so here the stimuli works this way. However, there are also um, other ways. Um, right now we don't, on, don't only have this crisis in demand, we also have a supply crisis. There are factories that are not operating, not because nobody would be there to buy their stuff, but because maybe the government forbid them to keep on, on um, producing because um, uh, too many people might get infected in that factory. And if some of the factory produce stuff that are needed in another factory, that other factory will also have to close down. So there's not only, um, not only are there too few people to buy the stuff that is produced, it's also the case that not always is there enough stuff produced or some stuff is no longer produced. I don't know, maybe you heard that um, the, the new iPhone uh, um, layout was, uh, the, the rollout of the new iPhone was delayed because there was um, a problem in production in China in, in January already. So we also have these kind of problems and they are far harder for the, for the state to, to overcome because you cannot just throw money at the problem and then get rid of it. However, there is another problem in business is that, that some businesses are not allowed to operate and if businesses are not allowed to operate for, for a certain time, then they will just um, um, don't have the money and will um, go broke. 
and then there will be no business and then there will be no employment and this would obviously be a bad situation. So what the governments also do is throw money at these businesses so that they will survive in spite of not being able to operate normally at the moment. And will this work? Will this work fully? Probably not. Probably people will use their jobs, businesses will go broke. I'm pretty certain of that. But fewer, uh, fewer will lose their employment, fewer will lose their businesses because of the government stimuli. And will this cause um, inflation? There is a chance that some inflationary dynamic will take place if there's not all the stuff produced that was produced before but if the government puts out a lot of money then it might be that many people have money and there isn't that much stuff to buy from that money so it might be that the money will lose value and the stuff um, will gain value and we might see some of that um, in, in the food prices or so however we must also say that it might be that some people will just save some of the money and buy new cars next year it might be um, or, or put another way inflation was never a big problem in the last couple of years or decades in any of the advanced economies so there were a lot of problems in the economy but inflation wasn't one of them and the fear of inflation is a very German thing it's probably some kind of cultural thing also that Germans are always worried about inflation but right now there is, isn't that much reason to worry about inflation although some inflationary dynamics might take place due to the um, current government stimuli. Next question is the last question. Do critical approaches see any value in the market or is the construction and function of the market in general normatively bad and exploiting in itself? Therefore, is every market interaction an act of exploitation? These are three questions that might demand three kinds of answers. But here's the short answer. If we think of Marxism, almost all Marxists agree that capitalism is a great thing when it comes to um, creating more production. And many Marxists believe that, that capitalism expanded production in a way that would have never been possible in other ways and that made it um, possible to produce so much that nobody has to suffer a lack of anything um, and particularly not starve ever any ever again. However, they claim that capitalism also comes with big problems and these problems make it impossible for capitalism to actualize this potential, which means that under capitalism people are still starving in spite of it not being um, necessary. So it's kind of a good thing but also a bad thing and many Marxists want to keep the good things of capitalism and overcome the bad things and how that's going to work and whether it's going to work um, is a long uh, discussion. Um, and, but if we take your questions um, ad verbatim you would say that the function of the market in general it's exploiting itself. Many Marxists would say yes it is is every market in the action an act of exploitation? Probably not, but the way the market is, work, market is working is always resulting in exploitation. But is it therefore in general normatively bad? Not necessarily. It might have its historic um, um, uh, legitimacy. However, there are also other critics um, who are not necessarily Marxists who are right now um, working on the label of post-development um, post um, theory, who are saying, well, all this productivism where we produce ever more stuff that the capitalists like so much, that many Marxists mark like so much, that Keynesians like so much, that's not actually a good idea. We are already producing way too much and it's not good for the environment, it's not good for human beings, and we should have some kind of degrowth and sometimes it's also um, labeled as um, degrowth theory but critical theory is manifold and there are many theories that um, claim themselves to be critical theories and not all of them have the same stance here. Okay that was my first question and answer session again it has become way too long way longer than I would have expected I, I'm still going to upload it pretty much like this 
but I have to try to make it shorter in the future. My excuse is that this was a double session, but I really don't want to go more than 30 minutes in the future for my sake, for your sake. But for now, I wish all of you um, a good weekend and um, see you again on Tuesday. Goodbye.